Chapter 12, Neural Tissue. This is a rather lengthy chapter. On top of that, it's also complicated. You will find it's an all or nothing experience. If you study this enough, you will understand everything. It will eventually all fit together. But if you don't, it'll be really easy to get a large list of similar names confused with one another and not do well on the next midterm. The first part of this lecture will spend a lot of time covering the basic cells of nervous tissue. As we cover glia, we'll be covering the types of cells that are involved in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and even those very important to spinal paralysis. We'll induce the topic of neurogenesis as well. Can we grow new neurons if our old ones have been damaged? To do that today, we'll cover the basics of the nervous system, dividing it into a central and peripheral nervous system, dividing the peripheral nervous system into an afferent and an efferent division, dividing the efferent division into a motor and an autonomic division, and dividing the autonomic division into a sympathetic and parasympathetic division. And because you all want to become anatomists, you're going to be really happy with all of these different lists. Then we'll talk about the two basic cell types of the nervous system. We'll talk about neurons. That's one type. We've got about a hundred years worth of information about neurons. And then we'll talk about glia. There's a number of different types of glia, but we only have roughly a decade or two's worth of information about these cell types. So I don't have a lot to say about them, but there's one thing that you should know about me and you should know about the human body is that these cell types are way more important than your textbook says. So what little we do know about them is going to be absolutely necessary for you to know to score well on the exam. The nervous system includes a number of organs, including the brain and spine, and sensory receptors like eyes and ears, and nerves which connect all of these structures together. The central nervous system includes the spinal cord and the brain. This is where most of the processing and coordination of information occurs. The peripheral nervous system, on the other hand, primarily serves as a communication system. It delivers information from one place to another place. It includes nerves, sensory organs, and structures called ganglia. To begin, let's talk about the difference between neurons and nerves, two words that begin with the letter N, which is always confusing to me. Neurons are cells. We would need a microscope to see them. They are capable of sending information in one direction only. Nerves, on the other hand, are organs. They compose a lot of neurons surrounded by connective tissue with some other tissues. It is possible for a nerve to send information in two directions because they contain neurons pointing in one way and another way. So nerves are bundles of the axons of neurons, plus some connective tissue, plus blood vessels. Because they are composed of more than one tissue type, that makes them an organ. When we look at neural tissue, it is composed of two major cell types. The first type are neurons. We know a heck of a lot about neurons, and we're going to spend about two lectures worth covering what we know about this cell type. On the other hand, we also have neuroglia, which are six or more different cell types. We don't know as much about them, so I'm going to cover pretty much everything that the textbook says about them in today's lecture. Let's start with neurons. Neurons contain dendrites, which are highly branched structures which can receive information from other neurons. The cell body of a neuron, sometimes called the soma, includes all of the basic subcellular structures that you learned about in BI-231 or your cell biology class, like the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum,
and mitochondria. Next up is the axon hillock. This will be a very important structure when we talk about action potentials because this is where they begin and then those action potentials will travel all the way down this long extension called the axon. I have some axons which start at the top of my head and extend all the way down to my sacrum and then some more which begin around my sacral region and extend all the way down to my big toes or my hallux. Some axons are going to be insulated by material called myelin. Most of the major organelles of the neuron are located within the cell body, including the nucleus, most of the cytoplasm, the mitochondria, and a number of very important cytoskeletal elements that we're not going to be covering in much detail. Once upon a time, a guy named Nissel discovered some dark staining objects within the cytoplasm, and he named them after himself. We now know that these are ribosomes. So why don't we just call them ribosomes? On the dendrites, there are a number of very fine branches. Maybe you can think of these as the individual leaves called dendritic spines. And this greatly increases the surface area of our receiving portion of the neuron. The axon, and there's usually just one, is an extremely long process most of the time. It can extend up to a meter and a half, for instance. This is the part of the neuron that sends information to whatever target we need to send that information to. The axon hillock is a fat blob that represents the beginning of the axon. Some axons will have collaterals. Not all, but when they do, keep in mind that the information that goes down one branch will also travel down the next branch. At the very end of the axons are divisions called telodendria, and the very ends of these divisions are called synaptic terminals. My little metaphor here is that at the end of my arm, I've got fingers. Those would represent the telodendria, and synaptic terminals would be where my fingertips touch another object. Where my fingertips touched another object, we would call that a synapse. That is where one neuron connects to another neuron. In the previous term, we talked about where neurons connected to muscle cells. This term will typically talk about where the axon terminals connect to the dendrites of a second neuron. When we do so, we could talk about the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell and the synaptic cleft. The presynaptic cell is the one that is sending information to the postsynaptic cell, and the cleft is the tiny bit of space between the axon terminal and the dendritic spine of the next cell. Keep in mind that these are relative terms. There is never any cell that would always be called presynaptic. For instance, let's draw the next cell in this series. Now we have to bump everything down I could talk about the next presynaptic cell and the last postsynaptic cell, and we have now discussed a second synaptic cleft. Synapses are where neurotransmission occurs. That is when the presynaptic neuron releases chemicals called neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. They diffuse just a short distance away to bind to receptor proteins found on the dendrites of the postsynaptic cell. And in this fashion, we have now sent the signal from one cell to the next. Lastly, we have enzymes that can remove or recycle the neurotransmitters out of the cleft. Last quarter, we talked about acetylcholinesterase, removing acetylcholine from the neuromuscular junction, and it's the same process here. Here are some pretty pictures of what neurons look like. Their axons are found up here, all bundled together, and all the cell bodies of the different neurons are down here, along with their dendrites. Here are some more fun images.
On the left, we see neurons growing in developing fly larvae. Their axons and dendrites are still growing outwards to make connections. On the right-hand side, we see an adult human neuron and its high number of dendrites for making lots and lots of connections. Next up, just for fun, this video shows us neurons in action. Neurons in the eyes of this fish are going to be sending information to other parts of the fish brain, telling them that the fish is in motion. And this information will be further distributed to other parts of the nervous system. So here what we are looking at is the activity of these neurons as they fire electrical signals and then transmit these signals to distant locations. Neurons come in three basic shapes based off of where their cell body is located. No matter what though, a neuron always has a group of extensions called dendrites and then a long axon with axon terminals. The cell body might be off to the side, in the middle, or connected directly to the dendrites. It doesn't really matter. In any case, these all have the same basic function, and that's what we're going to be focused on. More useful to us will be classifying neurons based off of their functions. Neurons can be classified as sensory neurons, which send information to the central nervous system, interneurons, which are those neurons found between one neuron and another, and motor neurons, which send information away from the central nervous system to skeletal, smooth, or cardiac muscle, for instance. Of our sensory receptors, these can be divided into categories based off of where the senses are located. Exteroreceptors are those neurons that detect information coming from outside the body, like vision and sound. Interoreceptors detect things happening inside the body, like blood pressure. And proprioceptors are a special type of interoceptor. They detect how stretched muscles and tendons are, which give us a sense of our body position. Similarly, we can categorize motor neurons leaving the CNS. Somatic motor neurons are those that control skeletal muscle. The autonomic nervous system has motor neurons which control cardiac and smooth muscle. Interneurons are mostly found in the central nervous system. These are the ones that are responsible for processing and coordinating information. So those are the basic types of neurons. That's a large number of lists. We'll be going into more detail throughout the rest of this lecture. For now, we're moving on to glia. On the left here, we see a fairly typical image of neurons in the brain. Only the neurons have been stained, which makes it look like there are large gaps between them. And in reality, those gaps are full of glia. Over on the right, we have a much more accurate representation of neural tissue. There are some neurons in there, but the vast majority of those cells are glia, and they're all tightly packed together. The only gaps that you see in this picture over here are the gaps inside of blood vessels. Between 50 to 80% of the cells in the nervous system are glia. I find it interesting that we don't have a more accurate number. In fact, I think you'd be pretty upset with me if you asked me what your grade was, and I told you somewhere between 50 to 80%. Maybe an F, maybe a B, maybe somewhere in between. It's not easy to count when there are trillions of cells, especially when those cells exist over broad reaches of space. It's hard to know if you cut through one slice if one part belongs to a cell that you already counted on another slice. We'll cover the major types of glia. These four are found in the central nervous system and they include ependymal cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and microglia. The ependymal cells form a structure that looks very similar to an epithelium. They form a barrier between one space in the brain and the next. These cells are capable of making and circulating cerebrospinal fluid, which would be located on one side of this barrier.
Here is what ependymal cells look like under the microscope. In particular, we are looking at the central canal here in the spinal cord. They would be making and secreting cerebrospinal fluid to this space here. Next up are the microglia. These cells are white blood cells that migrated into the brain and took up permanent residence. They are responsible for gobbling up debris and destroying pathogens. Next up are the astrocytes. These cells regulate the blood-brain barrier, which is a barrier between what is in the bloodstream and what can actually get out of the bloodstream and touch cells in the brain. They're also responsible for repairing damage and guiding the development of the nervous system. Here's a cartoon of an astrocyte, and it shows their basic organizational pattern. They have long extensions that connect to blood vessels and can move nutrients from those blood vessels all the way to deeper locations in the brain, distributing those nutrients to neurons where they are needed. For instance, way out at these synapses. Over here on the right, we can see what this looks like under the microscope. These astrocytes are star-shaped cells, and their long extensions look very similar to the dendrites of neurons. Next up are the oligodendrocytes. These cells produce myelin within the central nervous system. We might call the space where myelin is located an internode, but there are gaps in the myelin called nodes or more old-fashionedly, the nodes of Ranvier. Here's a picture of how these cells make myelin. They find an axon and start wrapping themselves around that axon over and over and over again. All of the phospholipids of the plasma membrane, as well as special lipophilic proteins that make up myelin, now insulate this axon. Here are some more pictures of how oligodendrocytes look. As you can see, one oligodendrocyte is capable of producing myelin on several different axons. If we slice through the brain, we can see regions with a lot of myelin. That is white matter. It appears white because there's a lot of lipid content in this area. Gray matter, on the other hand, does not contain much myelin. It's mostly cell bodies and dendrites of neurons. Let's move on to the peripheral nervous system. The two major types of glia found here are satellite cells, which we will find surrounding the cell bodies of neurons found in structures called ganglia. And we also have Schwann cells, a second type of cell that makes myelin. This cell type, again, is only found in the peripheral nervous system. Here's a photo of what ganglia look like. They just look like large blobs that are part of a nerve. It's in here that we will find the cell bodies of all of the neurons and the satellite cells surrounding them. The rest of this nerve would be axons and Schwann cells that are myelinating those axons. This is what ganglia look like under the microscope. Here we can find the cell bodies of neurons Here's one with a nucleus. And then surrounding these cell bodies are smaller cells. These are the satellite cells out here. Here are some pictures of satellite cells producing myelin in the peripheral nervous system. It's the same substance that oligodendrocytes make, but we're going to have an important functional difference between these two cell types. These two cell types do look different in the way that they make myelin. Oligodendrocytes reach out to myelinate multiple axons, whereas Schwann cells may myelinate only one axon or a bundle of axons together. So those are the two basic cell types of the nervous system. We have neurons, which are specialized at producing electrical signals and transmitting that information to more neurons. And we have the glia, which are a large number of cells, which can do a number of things, including 
making sure that the neurons are wired up in the proper orientation. We know a lot about neurons, and over the next hour or two, I will be telling you about how neurons function. Our understanding of how neurons function have allowed us to reverse the process of wrinkling in the forehead with the use of botulism toxin. On the other hand, we know much less about the glia, and I think, for that reason, we are still far away from reversing the effects of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease and paralysis. Let's talk about injury to the nervous system. There's going to be a very important difference between injury to the peripheral nervous system versus injury to the central nervous system. And that difference is mediated by our two cell types that make myelin. In the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells are going to be able to mediate regeneration and repair of damage. Whereas in the central nervous system, oligodendrocytes are not only not going to repair the damage, they're going to make that damage even worse. In the peripheral nervous system, nerves are bundles of axons that are myelinated by Schwann cells. All of these bundles are wrapped up in a connective tissue layer. If there's damage to this nerve, the axons distal to the injury will die because they're no longer connected to a cell. But that cell is still alive. The Schwann cells that are no longer connected to axons would de-differentiate and start secreting growth factors. And the neuron could regrow its axon towards those growth factors. That axon only has one direction to travel because it's limited by the tube created by the connective tissue. So over months of time, it will grow back towards the original target. It'll eventually form a synapse. And once that happens, the Schwann cells can begin producing myelin once again to insulate this axon and make sure that it's functioning properly. Now the new connections that are made may be scrambled in terms of which motor units they're connected to, but they should be connected to the right target at the very least. So it may take some relearning how to control these muscles, but I should still be controlling the same muscles, not different ones. For severe injuries, we may need to replace the connective tissue tube to make sure that the axons grow in the correct direction. That can be done by grafting nerve tissue from a cadaver. To reduce the risk of tissue rejection, that nerve will be stripped of all of its cells first, leaving behind just the connective tissue, which is mostly collagen. This collagen will provide a scaffold along which the axons can grow. In fact, the scaffold can be permeated with the correct growth factors to help the Schwann cells de-differentiate and start releasing the growth factors that help the nerve axon to grow back in the correct direction. If you wish to know more, you can go look at the video link that I've provided down below. This is optional, but it is a journal club that I recorded on YouTube. The response to tissue injury in the central nervous system is very different than that of the peripheral nervous system. And that's going to be mediated by the oligodendrocytes. A small injury to the spine, for instance, may sever a few axons and the portion of the axon distal to the injury will degenerate, just like we saw in the spine. However, oligodendrocytes will not attempt to repair this injury. In fact, they will kill off the neurons that were damaged and any other neurons that they are connected to, even undamaged ones. What's more, they release inflammatory molecules that will induce apoptosis of distant neurons to the injury. So what we see in the central nervous system is that a small amount of damage can become a very large amount of damage thanks to the actions of oligodendrocytes and the inflammatory response. For this reason, a spinal injury or stroke is often treated with a powerful anti-inflammatory to try and block the spread of the injury and prevent it from getting worse. There's 
conflicting evidence in the literature about how effective anti-inflammatories are for spinal injuries, but I think it's fairly typical for EMTs to administer a powerful anti-inflammatory drug like methylprednisolone when they suspect spinal injuries. Note, we only have to suspect a spinal injury to inject these drugs. Their side effects are very low and they're fairly cheap and there is good reason to believe that they could be very beneficial to the patient should they have damage to the central nervous system. So those are the basic cell types found in nervous tissue, the neurons and the glia, and some of their basic functions. We went into more detail comparing the oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells and how they respond to injury. This is going to be very important for you healthcare professionals, so make sure that you go over that bit of physiology. But for now, this would be a good spot to take a break. Welcome back. In the second part of the lecture, I'm going to be talking about how neurons generate electrical signals. As I do so, you can think about why sodium tastes so good. It's going to be absolutely necessary for our neurons to have plenty of sodium. And as a result, our brains are hardwired to eat as much of that substance as possible. Otherwise, the second part of this lecture is going to have a lot of very basic material on which we will build in the third part of the lecture. But I will talk a little bit about anesthesia as we go through the basic functions of neurons. So the second part of the lecture, we'll start with a protein called the sodium potassium pump, and then we'll talk about some voltage-gated sodium channels and potassium channels and ligand-gated ion channels. So we'll have a lot more proteins to discuss. We'll talk about action potentials, graded potentials, membrane potentials, threshold potentials. It's going to be very easy to get all of those things confused if you don't study it enough. We'll talk about the substance myelin in more detail. And then we'll talk about how we convert information into electrical signals. Neurons are cells that are specialized at generating electrical signals. They're very good at it, but they're hardly the only cell type in the body that does so. Last quarter, we talked about muscle cells firing electrical signals, and we even talked about osteocytes responding to electrical signals. These electrical signals were generated when stress was put on bone tissue, but the osteocytes could respond to that signal by increasing bone density in that area. Many cells in the body contain the sodium potassium pump, but it is especially important for neurons. This is a transmembrane protein that is capable of moving three sodium ions out of the cell and moving two potassium ions into the cell. Because we may be pumping these ions against their concentration gradient, this requires ATP. We're also setting up an electrical gradient I am moving more positives out than in, and that is going to re require energy. The end result is that the cell is going to become polarized, meaning that it is different on the outside than on the inside. There's a lot more potassium inside and a lot more sodium outside. Lastly, the sodium potassium pump has to move those numbers of ions. It's always three sodiums and two potassiums, not three sodiums and one potassium, or two sodiums and two potassiums, or no sodium and three potassiums. It's always three sodium out and two potassium in. The sodium potassium pump therefore sets up two gradients, chemical gradients and an electrical gradient. By pumping out more sodium than I'm pumping potassium in, I have set up two different forces. Because there's a lot of sodium outside of the cell and not much in, I've got a chemical gradient for sodium. It would want to rush back into the cell if it was able to. But we've also got to worry about an electrical gradient. Because I've lost some positive charges inside of the cell, there are now relatively more negative ions than positive ions. 
inside of the cell, as we see here. That's also going to attract sodium into the cell. Positives are attracted to negatives. We're now going to say that this cell is polarized, which just means that it's different on the inside versus the outside. If I opened up ion channels, sodium would want to rush into the cell, and potassium would want to rush out down its chemical gradient. This is where we're going to start, at the resting potential. The sodium-potassium pump has pumped more positives out than back in, making the inside relatively negatively charged. In fact, we can assign a number to the resting potential and call it minus 70 millivolts. That number might be different in different books. That's what I will stick with for the rest of the lecture. Your book may also talk about equilibrium potentials for specific ions, and that's important if you want to do the Nernst equation. However, I don't know of any medical application for the Nernst equation. I learned how to do it. I could plug in numbers and spit out answers, but I didn't really understand what was going on. When the instructor asked me, okay, does that mean sodium is going in or out? I wasn't sure. That's what I would like you to be able to do. Tell me whether sodium would be going in or out. What is potassium doing at any given time? So I'm going to be focusing more on the overall patterns, not much on the numbers. So let's start off with a cell. There is more potassium inside and more sodium outside, thanks to the sodium-potassium pump. I'm not going to draw all of the negative charges from here on out. It just gets too messy. But you remember that the cell is relatively negatively charged inside. Let's focus on sodium to begin with. And we're going to have to focus on the electrochemical gradient on sodium ions. But we can break this down into two parts and think about them individually, even though they're happening at the same time. The chemical gradient for sodium is to rush into the cell because there's this concentration gradient. If sodium were allowed to move, it would move into the cell. And this requires no energy. We used the energy to set up the gradient. Now sodium could just move passively. But the electrical gradient is the same because the inside of the cell is negatively charged and sodium is a positively charged cation. It also wants to enter the cell because it's attracted to that negative charge. So I've got two forces acting on sodium ions, the chemical gradient and the electrical gradient. And in this case, both of them are in the same direction. So sodium really wants to rush into the cell. It can't do so at rest because it can't move across the plasma membrane on its own. But if we were to open up ion channels that allowed sodium through, that's exactly what would happen. Sodium will rush into the cell. The gradients on potassium are similar, but potassium is highly concentrated inside of the cell, so its concentration gradient is such that it would want to leave the cell. However, the electrical gradient is the same as for sodium. Potassium is also positively charged, therefore it is attracted to the inside of the cell. At rest, these two forces are roughly going to balance one another meaning if I opened up a potassium channel, very little would happen. The two forces are opposing. But we can make this a little bit more complex. What if I opened up a protein that allowed anything with a positive charge to travel through it? What would happen? Well, sodium would want to rush into the cell and potassium wouldn't want to do much at all. So sodium would rush into the cell. This is going to change the electrical gradient because there's now more sodium inside of the cell. That's a lot more positive charges. The inside of the cell is no longer negatively charged. And for that reason, after sodium rushes in, potassium is now going to want to rush out of the cell. And this is going to be happening during an electrical signal in a neuron that we're going to call an action potential. Potentials are the measurement of the electrical charges in one place relative to another. 
we can literally stick electrodes into a neuron and compare the electrical charges inside of the cell with outside of the cell. And at rest, the inside of a neuron is at minus 70 millivolts, thanks to the sodium potassium pump. However, when we open up sodium channels and allow sodium to rush into the cell, the cell now becomes positively charged, thanks to all of those extra cations that are now inside. There are a large number of different potentials that you are responsible for learning. We already covered the resting potential. This is where we started thanks to the sodium potassium pump. We were at minus 70 millivolts inside of the cell. There can be changes to this though. We can go upwards or downwards from there. And if we wanted to measure the charge across the plasma membrane at some other time, we would call that the membrane potential. Changes to the membrane potential happen out at the dendrites in things called graded potentials. If these changes are big enough to bring us up to the threshold potential, to bring us past minus 60 millivolts, that will trigger an action potential along the axon. So if you don't understand what these five things are yet, that's okay. I'm going to be going over them over the next 20 or so slides but come back to this page and make sure you know what all five of these things are and make sure you don't get them confused. I'm gonna start with a metaphor that should help explain the difference between a graded potential and an action potential. Let's imagine I've set up a bunch of dominoes in a series. I could push on that first domino and if I did so very gently, it might not fall over. I could push on it a little harder and a little harder and a little harder and eventually, if I pushed it hard enough, the first domino would fall over. And when that happened, all of the rest of the dominoes would fall. The first push was our graded potential. It could come in different sizes. And if the size of that graded potential was enough to push the first one over, then all of the rest fell. The action potential, we say, is all or nothing. Just like those dominoes, they either remain standing upright or they fall over. You can't get half of them falling over, you can't get them falling halfway over, and you can't get them falling at twice the speed or at half the speed. It'll always be the same. They fall over or they don't. So those are our two basic types of potentials, the graded and the action potentials. These potentials can happen because of ion channels proteins found in the plasma membrane of neurons. And these ion channels come in two or three basic flavors. The first type are the chemically gated ion channels, or as I'm going to call them from here on out, ligand gated ion channels. These will open up in response to some sort of chemical, usually a neurotransmitter. We find these out on the dendrites. On the axons, we will find voltage gated ion channels. These are going to respond to changes in electricity and will open or close. Lastly, there are some mechanically gated ion channels that can open up in response to physical pressure. These are going to be important out in our fingertips and other places where we can detect touch. I am going to be focusing primarily on these first two over the next hour. The ligand gated ion channels open up in response to a chemical binding to the active site found on the extracellular surface. This will open up the pore, which will allow ions to move passively down their electrochemical gradient. For instance, sodium may rush into the cell, causing a graded potential. When the chemical goes away, the ion channel closes and sodium can no longer move. So this ligand gated ion channel is also a neurotransmitter receptor. We've got a lot of different names for the same thing. Just be aware of that. The voltage gated ion channels are found along the axon and these respond to changes in voltage. When the inside of the cell is negatively charged, these ion channels are closed. But if a little bit of positive charge enters the cell, 
these ion channels can open up. And now more sodium will be able to rush into the cell down its electrochemical gradient. Eventually, though, if the cell becomes positively charged enough, those positive charges will try and repel the structure down here called the ball and chain, and it tries to flee. But it can't get very far because it's chained to this ion channel, and it winds up plugging the pore, and we call this inactivating the ion channel. To go back to our original state, closed, we have to get rid of all of the positive charges and go back to being negatively charged inside of the cell. The ball and chain can flip back to its original position, but the gate will also be closed now. Ligand gated ion channels were therefore a little bit simpler. They go from closed to open back to closed again based off of whether a chemical was present or not. The voltage gated ion channels were one step more complex. They started off closed, they could open, they would next inactivate and then go back to closed. They can't go in any other order. On your typical neuron, the ligand gated ion channels are found out at the dendrites. This is where graded potentials can happen. But if the graded potential is big enough to activate the first voltage gated sodium channel found on the axon hillock, then the rest of those will open up just like our dominoes falling over. So the voltage gated sodium channels will respond in an all or nothing format. Whereas the ligand gated ion channels create graded potentials. They could allow in a little bit of sodium or a little bit more or a little bit more. Graded potentials sometimes get called local potentials, and that's because where one ligand gated ion channel opens up, the cytoplasm near that ion channel is changing. Sodium is rushing in locally. This does not change the electrical potential across the entire cell, just in a region close to where this ion channel opened up. We can now talk about what happens on muscles in a little bit more detail. The same thing can happen on many neurons. Acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, binds to its receptor, called a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is a ligand gated ion channel. And when that happens, the ion channel opens up and sodium rushes into the cell. And we're going to call this depolarization. The cell started polarized. It was relatively negative inside. And as positive ions rush in, it's now less polarized or depolarized. So depolarization occurs anytime a positive ion enters the cell. Repolarization occurs when you pump those positive ions back out. For instance, with the sodium potassium pump, bringing us back down to minus 70. And if I were to overshoot and go below minus 70, I would say the cell is hyperpolarized. I'm even more negatively charged. Here is our textbook picture of what these changes look like on our electrical readout. Depolarization is any time we're going above minus 70. Repolarization is any time we're going back down towards minus 70. Hyperpolarization is any time we're going below that. And lucky for you, we didn't really give a special name to this last bit here. That's still depolarizing. We're going upwards. And you'll notice, of course, that our book chose a different number for the resting potential than I did. They say minus 60. It's different in different cells. That part doesn't matter too much. We have just covered most of the proteins you're going to need to know. We started with the sodium potassium pump. This was the only one that used energy and it required energy because it was setting up both an electrical gradient and a chemical gradient. It was getting our cell to the resting potential. We could change the membrane potential by opening up ligand gated ion channels. These caused graded potentials graded potentials frequently depolarize the cell 
but we might see some other types of graded potentials. Next up, let's talk about an action potential. If we reached threshold, this is going to trigger an all or none response called an action potential. This will start at the axon hillock and travel all the way down the axon until it reaches the axon terminals. Those axon terminals could be several feet away from the beginning. An action potential can be triggered by a graded potential out of the dendrites. That graded potential must be big enough to depolarize the axon hillock and bring the membrane potential there up to threshold or minus 60 millivolts. An even bigger graded potential will do the same thing. What we need to do is bring the axon hillock up to minus 60 millivolts. It doesn't matter whether it's more, but if it's less, then we're not going to trigger an action potential. So bigger signals are not going to generate bigger action potentials. They will do something, but the action potential is always going to be the same. It either happens or it doesn't. Let's review our voltage-gated sodium channels. These open up in response to voltage, meaning we've brought this axon hillock up to the threshold potential. That's enough positive charge to move the gate out of the way, opening up the pore. More sodium can then rush into the cell down its electrochemical gradient. When we depolarize the cell enough, that will cause the ball and chain to try and leave, and it winds up plugging up the pore and inactivating the voltage-gated sodium channel. To bring this back to the closed state, I need to remove all of those positive charges. I need to go back to minus 70. Then the ball and chain can exit the pore, and the gate can flip back to the closed conformation. So we had three states to the voltage-gated sodium channel, closed, open, and inactivated. The voltage-gated sodium channels are found all along the axon, starting at the axon hillock, going all the way down to the axon terminals. Our initial stimulus begins out of the dendrites, thanks to the ligand-gated ion channels, which create a graded potential. If this is big enough to get us to threshold at the axon hillock, the first voltage-gated sodium channel opens, which will open up the next one, which will open up the next one, and that'll open up the next one, and so on and so forth. When we reach the end, the action potential is going to stop. It can't travel backwards because the channels behind the one that just opened are in the inactivated state. So our neuron can only send information in one direction. To fire the next action potential, we're going to have to get those voltage-gated sodium channels out of the inactivated state back to just being plain old closed. So that's where we're going next. First, let's review the electrochemical gradients acting on potassium. The chemical gradient is such that potassium wants to leave the cell because there's already a lot of potassium in the cytoplasm. But the electrical gradient at rest wants to hold potassium in the cell. Potassium is positively charged and at rest the cell is negatively charged. These two forces balance one another out. If a potassium channel were to open up at rest, very little would happen. However, during an action potential, a bunch of sodium rushes into the cell, making the cell positively charged. Now both the electrical and the chemical gradients want to drive potassium out of the cell. And this is going to happen during an action potential. When this happens, positive ions are leaving the cell. This will make the inside more negative once again. This will repolarize the cell. That's going to have effects on our voltage-gated sodium channels. So let's add this last final layer of complexity. Our third ion channel there in yellow are the voltage-gated potassium channels. These will open up during an action potential. 
we start the same way. A neurotransmitter binds to a ligand-gated ion channel out at the dendrites. This brings the axon hillock to threshold, and the first voltage-gated sodium channel opens up, which opens up the next one. But as potassium channels open up, potassium can leave the cell, which will repolarize the cell in that area. That allows the voltage-gated sodium channels to go from the inactivated state back to the closed state. And at this point, we would be able to fire another action potential. When looking at our electrical readout, the cell will start at rest at minus 70. Small changes in the membrane potential can be due to the opening of ligand-gated ion channels. But if that is not enough to bring us to minus 60 millivolts or to threshold, nothing will happen. We'll return to the resting potential. But if these graded potentials bring us to minus 60 or the threshold potential, then we'll open up the first of the voltage-gated sodium channels, which will open up more and more and more, causing an action potential. So these small blips on our readout represent the opening of ligand-gated ion channels. If that brings us to threshold, if the graded potential is big enough, we'll trigger an action potential, which represents activity of the voltage-gated sodium channels. Let's zoom in on the action potential and talk about that in a little more detail. Again, we might have small graded potentials that aren't big enough to bring us to threshold. But once we reach this threshold, that was the voltage required to open up the first voltage-gated sodium channel, which will open up more and more and more, giving us the rising phase of the action potential. We are depolarizing going past the zero millivolts all the way up to plus 50 or 60 millivolts or so. At some point though, we stop going upwards and we reach a plateau. That plateau happens because the voltage-gated sodium channels, when we depolarize enough, inactivate. The ball and chain plugs up the pore. And it's at this point that the first of the voltage-gated potassium channels open up and start letting potassium out of the cell. As potassium leaves, that causes our membrane potential to go back downwards or to repolarize. And in fact, we actually hyperpolarize a little bit down here, which is what brings our voltage-gated sodium channels back from being inactivated to our original closed state. And once these channels are back to being closed, we could fire another action potential. During the time between when the first voltage-gated sodium channels open until they go back to the closed state, we call that the absolute refractory period. What this means is that you cannot fire a second action potential during this time. During the relative refractory period, we could fire a second action potential because the voltage-gated sodium channels are closed once again. However, if you're starting further away from the finish line, if you are hyperpolarized, it's harder to fire the second action potential. It'll take an even bigger graded potential to bring you up to threshold. For that reason, we call it the relative refractory period. You can fire a second action potential, but it's going to be harder to do so than it was for the first action potential to go from minus 70 to minus 60. This relative refractory period has a significant effect on action potentials, namely on their frequency. All action potentials are the same, but it turns out that a bigger graded potential can trigger more rapid action potentials, meaning I get more action potentials per second. A smaller stimulus produces a lower frequency of action potentials. Again, every one of these action potentials is exactly the same, but a bigger stimulus will trigger a higher frequency of action potentials. For that reason, neurons can transduce information. They can convert a signal 
and the frequency of action potentials that they fire will represent the strength of that signal. That's going to mean the difference between a light touch versus a hard hit or a stab. So neurons code information in the frequency of action potentials. A bigger initial stimulus, a bigger graded potential can lead to higher frequency of action potentials. Again, this has to do with the relative refractory period. There's a maximum frequency. We cannot fire faster than the absolute refractory period. So there is an upper limit to the number of action potentials per second based off of this absolute refractory period. But thanks to the relative refractory period, we are going to convert small or large stimuluses at the dendrites into a, a lower or higher frequency of action potentials along the axon. The reason that it's harder to fire that second action potential during the relative refractory period is because potassium channels are open. It may have taken just a little bit of sodium entering the cell to open up that voltage-gated sodium channel. But during the relative refractory period, if potassium channels are open and I let in the same amount of sodium, let's see that happen. Here comes the same amount of sodium. An equal amount of potassium could just leave and the cell would not depolarize at all. We need to swamp out the potassium channels. I need to let in enough sodium so that it overcompensates for the potassium that's going to leave. That means it requires a bigger stimulus to fire the next action potential sooner. Otherwise, we have to wait until later when the potassium channels close. Looking at our electrical recording once again, it's going to take a bigger stimulus if I start from way down here to reach threshold than it would if I started from over here. That means larger stimuli will stimulate action potentials sooner. Smaller stimuli will trigger the next action potential later, leading to a lower frequency of action potentials. Frequency, of course, being the measurement of the number of waves per second. Now I can finally explain muscle cramps in a little bit more detail. Last quarter we talked about magnesium deficiency leading to one type of muscle cramps. Now we can talk about electrolyte loss. For instance, with excessive sweating. A muscle also fires action potentials. Sodium rushes in, potassium rushes out, and then the sodium potassium pump has to get all of those ions back to their original location to fire another action potential and cause another muscle contraction. So during a muscle contraction, sodium rushes in, potassium rushes out. If I want to go back to being relaxed, I'm going to have to get those ions back to where they were first located. So I contract my muscle again, sodium rushes in, potassium rushes out. However, with prolonged exercise, I may lose electrolytes due to sweating. Turns out we have plenty of sodium, but sometimes we can be depleted for potassium. And when that happens, the sodium potassium pump cannot pump the sodium back out of the cell. Remember, we had to trade three sodium for two potassium. And if there's no potassium in the extracellular fluid around this muscle cell, it's going to remain in the depolarized state and stay contracted, causing a cramp. If this is a nerve, this nerve would stay in the depolarized state and the axon would continually fire action potentials, which would cause a muscle to twitch or spasm. The solution to this, of course, is to drink fluid rich in electrolytes. Drinking plain old water would only make the problem worse. What little potassium you had in the extracellular fluid would simply become diluted if you added a bunch of extra water. So you don't want to drink plain old water, but something with electrolytes or eat a banana. <laughs>
Otherwise, the sodium-potassium pump doesn't work. So here's the big summary slide. We're going to start at minus 70 millivolts, and we've got our electrode in this one particular spot on the cell. And we're going to measure the membrane potential right here. We're going to start by opening up ligand-gated ion channels out of the dendrites, which will allow some sodium to rush into the cell. And if this graded potential is big enough to bring the axon hillock to threshold, that will open up our first voltage-gated sodium channel. When it opens up, it allows more sodium in, which will open up more voltage-gated sodium channels, triggering an action potential. And we get our rising phase as large amounts of sodium rush into the cell, depolarizing it. Eventually, these voltage-gated sodium channels will inactivate. The ball and chain plugs up the pore, and we reach the plateau phase on our electrical readout. At this point, the voltage-gated potassium channels will open up and begin letting potassium out of the cell. So right at this spot, as potassium leaves, this will repolarize this area of the neuron, bringing it back down towards minus 70. In fact, enough potassium will leave that will overshoot and hyperpolarize. So right at this moment, further down the axon, the action potential is spreading. But right at the spot where we're measuring, these voltage-gated sodium channels should be flipping back to the closed state because we've hyperpolarized. It's at this point that I could fire a second action potential. This action potential will continue traveling down the axon until it reaches the axon terminal. And in the last part of the lecture, we'll talk about what happens there. I have typed out for you everything that I just said here on these next couple of slides. I'm not going to repeat myself. Before we finish up for the day, let's go through a little bit of history that involves voltage-gated sodium channels. Back in 400 BC, a Greek general by the name of Xenophon was hired by a small king in Persia to march into Persia and help wage war against a bigger king. The Greeks were battle-hardened soldiers and they won the battle for the small king. Unfortunately, the small king was killed in the battle and the Greeks found themselves losing the war and surrounded by enemies deep in enemy territory. It took them decades of fighting to march their way back over mountains and through forests until they eventually reached the sea, whereupon they knew they could build some ships and sail back to Greece. They celebrated with some locals by eating a bunch of honey. Unbeknownst to them, when honey is made by bees that pollinate, I believe, magnolias? Did I write it down? Nope, rhododendrons. If bees pollinate only rhododendrons, the honey that they make is poisonous. The locals had built up a tolerance to it over the years, but the Greeks succumbed to its effects, going crazy for a few days. Luckily, the locals didn't assassinate them in their crazed state, and a few days later, most of the Greeks recovered and got on ships and sailed home. And you can read, in his own words, the adventures of Xenophon uh, in his book, The Anabasis. It's important to read your history. The Roman Pompey the Great didn't read his history. And when he merged into Persia, his soldiers ate the same honey. Unfortunately for them, the locals were not so nice and killed most of them while they were going crazy. It turns out that when bees pollinate rhododendrons, they bring back some poisons from that plant called gryanotoxins. And these chemicals can bind to the voltage-gated sodium channels keeping them in the open state, they cannot inactivate. Meaning once you open them up, they stay open and that neuron cannot rest. That's very problematic for muscles that need to go through a contraction relaxation cycle, like your diaphragm. It doesn't do you any good to breathe in if you can't breathe out next. So these toxins can be poisonous at high enough doses. Luckily for the Greeks, they did not get that dose, or at least most of them. Voltage-gated sodium channels can also 
cause effects in the brain, obviously, and that's why this honey is known as mad honey. That's not so much of a problem in the United States. Many people have rhododendrons in their yard, but bees hardly restrict themselves to simply pollinating those plants. You really need to have a forest of these, and they need to be very large, more like trees rather than the shrubs I'm used to. So that wraps up graded potentials, action potentials, the threshold potential, the membrane potential. We talked about voltage-gated sodium channels, how they open up and depolarize the cell, how they inactivate and the cell will plateau, and then the voltage-gated potassium channels can open up and lead to the repolarizing phase of an action potential. And because we hyperpolarize a little bit, this will lead to the relative refractory period, which was of course important because it's how neurons will be able to translate larger signals into a higher frequency of action potentials. But this would represent a good spot to take a break, grab a drink, and come back when you're ready. Welcome back to the third section. In this part, I need to continue talking about the axon and work our way down to the axon terminal. As I do so, I'll talk more about the difference between white and gray matter. I'll talk about when you step on a Lego late at night, why you might notice the feeling of that Lego and realize that it's going to hurt shortly before it actually does hurt. We'll talk about brain drain and why your brain tends to shut down after a long day, leaving you incapable of making simple decisions like, what should we eat for dinner? We'll be talking about some things that are related to genetically modified foods and colony collapse disorder, which are in the news these days. We'll talk about some psychoactive drugs. For instance, we will compare the use of LSD to the medication Prozac. We'll further get some basic information about depression and its molecular underpinnings. The neurotransmitter serotonin is definitely involved, but we'll need to discuss a little bit what is called the serotonin theory of depression. And in the next chapter, we'll have a better theory to go on. Lastly, I'll answer the question, why do I say ligand gated when neurotransmitter linked or chemically gated ion channel sounds so much simpler? To cover all of this, I'll be discussing myelin. We'll work our way to the axon terminal and discuss what happens at synapses and the neurotransmitters that are released there. We'll introduce the concept of a second messenger linked system, although if you had me for BI-231, this will be review. And then we'll talk about this process called facilitation, how we can help strengthen signals. One thing that can do that are a class of chemicals called neuromodulators. Let's start with myelin. Now we're talking about how fast an action potential travels down the axon. Not the frequency of action potentials, but how long it takes that action potential to go from point A to point B. There are two speeds at which action potentials travel. They can either be a slower continuous propagation, or they can be faster saltatory propagation. The faster ones are the ones that are myelinated. Let's review our action potential chemistry. A stimulus occurs at the dendrites and ligand gated ion channels open up, allowing the cell to depolarize to the point where the first voltage gated sodium channels open up, which allow in more sodium, which open up more voltage gated sodium channels, and so on and so forth, all the way down the length of this axon. Remember, some axons are really long, over a meter and a half in length. That would be a heck of a lot of voltage-gated sodium channels, considering these are too small to even see under the microscope. That's why some neurons have myelin, so that we don't need so many voltage-gated sodium channels. Myelin is an insulating material. Therefore, the sodium that rushes in at this area here can be detected way the heck down at this node down here. The insulation makes sure none of that electricity leaks out down this length of the axon. 
For that reason, I still need to open up ligand-gated ion channels at the dendrites, but I only need to have voltage-gated sodium channels located at these gaps called the nodes. Then the action potential will hop from node to node to node, traveling much faster than it was when we opened up voltage-gated sodium channels every inch of the way. To understand how important myelin is, we can look at people who have lower than normal levels of myelin in their body. The disease multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks myelin in the central nervous system. With that loss of myelin, ultimately it can be replaced with scar tissue, which causes permanent disability. Some of the symptoms of MS include visual problems, muscle weakness, and urinary incontinence. It can lead to paralysis and death, although usually it doesn't. Still, different patients can have a different severity in their MS symptoms. In a healthy axon, one that is myelinated, the voltage-gated sodium channels are only located at the nodes, and the signal can hop from node to node to node until it reaches the axon terminal, and we send our signal to the next target. With MS, the myelin is lost, and the electricity at one node leaks out before it reaches the next one, and the signal stops. If you were trying to control a muscle, this might mean your muscle contraction would be weaker or absent. If this was visual information being sent to the brain, it may never reach the brain and you would have problems seeing. What's more, with the lack of insulation, we can actually get extra signals, not just diminished signals. If I had two wires touching each other, they could short circuit. And axons fire electrical signals very similar to electrical wires. Without insulating material between them, one signal might trigger a spurious action potential in another axon. For instance, our patient might have been trying to move a muscle, but the action potential from that motor neuron triggered an action potential in a sensory neuron that relays pain information to the brain. And now the mere act of moving may cause discomfort. There is no cure for MS, but there are treatments. These treatments are usually drugs that inhibit the activity of the immune system. For instance, we could give a patient corticosteroids that we discussed last quarter. Recently, there was a little bit of a breakthrough in a stem cell therapy. Because the problem is the immune system, it is possible to get rid of a patient's immune system and replace it with somebody else's. Destruction of the bone marrow and then a bone marrow transplant could remove the cells that attack the myelin and replace them with other cells that do not. Because MS hardly ever causes death, and because this is a very invasive and risky therapy, this would only ever be done for patients whose MS is very severe. Right now, this is still experimental and has only been done in limited trials, but for the patients it's been done on, it has cured them of their disease. To further illustrate how important myelin is to the human body, let me point out that the first frontal lobotomies were performed by injecting alcohol into structures in the forebrain. Alcohol dissolves fat, which means it dissolves myelin. And with the destruction of myelin led to the destruction of parts of the forebrain. The first frontal lobotomies were done to alleviate the effects of schizophrenia, but later they were done to control difficult patients. And that, of course, was rather sad and violates our first rule, first do no harm. We still do some lobotomies. Cutting out regions of the brain can be a useful way to keep really bad epilepsy under control. But thankfully, we no longer do this to keep difficult people under control. There are three types of axons in the nervous system based off of size and myelin. There are some large myelinated fast fibers, some smaller myelinated medium fibers, and some really small unmyelinated fibers, and the last are the slowest of them all.
when we need really fast neurotransmission, for instance, for vision and balance, we use the fastest myelinated fibers. For things where I don't need a split second update, for instance, inflammatory pain, I'll use the type C fibers or the slow unmyelinated ones. So that leads us to the next question. Why are some axons myelinated and others not? If it's a matter of speed, I will use myelin along that axon. And if axons are really long, such as the ones that start at the top of my brain and go all the way down to my sacrum, it's just a matter of efficiency. That's a lot less sodium that I'll need to pump out with the sodium potassium pump after it rushes in if I only have those voltage gated sodium channels along nodes down the entire axon. So really long axons and axons that send really important information tend to be myelinated. Short ones and ones that send less important information can be unmyelinated. When you step on a Lego in the middle of the night, you may feel that Lego before you feel the pain. There's a split second difference between these two senses. That's because the touch neuron is myelinated, whereas the pain neuron is unmyelinated. So when you stimulate the dendrites of both of these, the pain neuron sent the information more slowly than the touch neuron. And your brain may have been aware of the feeling before the pain. Now you may ask, isn't pain important? And it turns out that most pain doesn't change very quickly. It'll ache for some time. So it would do you no good to have split second updates on that pain if it's not going to be changing. Hence, many pain neurons are unmyelinated. For that reason, we can administer drugs that diffuse through the skin to reach neurons and inactivate their voltage-gated sodium channels. Many anesthetics will block voltage-gated sodium channels. Diffusion to this unmyelinated neuron will happen pretty easily, but it won't reach the myelinated one, not at the correct dose. For that reason, lidocaine and other topical anesthetics can easily block unmyelinated pain neurons without blocking your ability to feel that part of your body or control muscles in that area. So that wraps up the importance of myelin and the difference between saltatory conduction and continuous conduction. Next, let's review what we've learned and what we still need to learn about action potentials. We can trigger graded potentials out of the dendrites by opening up ligand-gated ion channels. This may allow a little bit of sodium in, enough to open up the first voltage-gated sodium channel at the axon hillock which should open up the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Behind the action potential is a wave of inactivation and then repolarization. Here at the very end, though, is where we need to focus next. What happens when this action potential reaches the end of the neuron, or the axon terminal? At the axon terminal, we have a small amount of space where the first axon ends and the next dendrite begins. The action potential will end when it reaches the axon terminal, and then we will release a chemical signal across the cleft, which could bind to ligand-gated ion channels on the dendrite and trigger a graded potential on the postsynaptic cell. And if that graded potential was big enough, potentially we could trigger an action potential on the second cell. Let's review what we know about what happens at synapses. Our presynaptic neuron will fire an action potential, and when that action potential reaches the axon terminal, that will trigger the release of vesicles full of neurotransmitters. These vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, and the neurotransmitters diffuse a short distance away to bind to ligand-gated ion channels on the postsynaptic cell triggering graded potentials. If those graded potentials are big enough, we might fire an action potential. But for now, we need to worry more about what happens to the neurotransmitters. They should be quickly recycled or removed from the synaptic cleft 
for instance, the enzyme acetylcholinesterase could quickly break down acetylcholine. And if I wanted to continue to stimulate this postsynaptic neuron, I would need to continue to release acetylcholine. Drugs that inhibit this enzyme will trigger a buildup of neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. I released a little bit of neurotransmitter with the first action potential, and if it's not removed, then the second action potential will add to the first one. And I've got significantly more neurotransmitter in the cleft, meaning a bigger graded potential, meaning I'm more likely to fire an action potential. We talked about this last quarter with the muscles, organophosphate pesticides and certain chemical warfare agents can inhibit this breakdown enzyme. Similarly, some drugs that treat myasthenia gravis can also inhibit this enzyme. Examples of organophosphates include VX gas, which was a nerve agent used in World War I, and also recently in Syria, as well as the Nazi equivalent DFP. It includes the banned pesticides DDT and heptachlor, and the two currently legal pesticides, chlorpyrifos and dimethoate. The usage of the latter two has decreased significantly over recent years due to the invention of GM foods that incorporate their own organic pesticide into the plant itself, not requiring spraying with chemicals over their surface. The removal of neurotransmitters from the synaptic cleft may not only involve enzymes like acetylcholinesterase, it can involve the activity of glia, such as astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. These cells can not only remove the neurotransmitter, they can also remove some excess potassium that has exited the next neuron. This will slowly depolarize the astrocyte or oligodendrocyte. These cells do not fire action potentials, but they do fire electrical signals just slower, longer lasting ones. In fact, if you look at a PET scan of the brain, what you are mostly seeing is the electrical activity of glia. Remember, these electrical signals last for longer, and there's a lot more glia than neurons, so that represents the bulk of the signal. The fusion of vesicles with the plasma membrane at the axon terminal will actually require a calcium signal. For that reason, the voltage-gated sodium channels of the axon switch into voltage-gated calcium channels at the very ends of the axon terminals. When the action potential reaches the axon terminal, calcium enters, it causes two proteins to become very sticky, one of them on a vesicle, the other on the plasma membrane, which leads to fusion of the vesicular membrane with the plasma membrane. And now the inside of that vesicle becomes continuous with the outside of the cell, and the neurotransmitter diffuses down its concentration gradient to bind to the ligand-gated ion channels on the postsynaptic cell. This takes a little bit of time. Neurotransmitters diffuse more slowly than action potentials are propagated down an axon. For that reason, behaviors that involve more neurons will involve more synapses, and this will take more time. Reflexes can occur very quickly, whereas coming up with an answer to what is 27 times 12 should take a bit longer. Synapses will contain a lot of neurotransmitter, but not an infinite amount and it's possible for a neuron to release all of its neurotransmitter and become depleted. At the end of the day, this neuron would not be able to send a signal to the next cell, even if it was firing action potentials. In science, the technical term for this is brain fry, and it's easily resolved. Plenty of sleep or rest will allow this neuron to replenish its supply of neurotransmitter. So that's what happens at synapses. We talked about the release of neurotransmitters and the fusion of neurotransmitter-filled vesicles and also the removal of that neurotransmitter, such as with enzymes like acetylcholinesterase or by the activity of glia.
Let's move on to discuss the different neurotransmitters found in the brain. Back when I was in school, the list was small enough that we could simply memorize all 40 or 50 of them. But the list has increased over the decades, and it's so large now that it would be pointless to try and remember them all. That's what iPhones are for. All neurotransmitters are small chemicals released by neurons, which can bind to receptors on the postsynaptic side of a cell. The interaction between a neurotransmitter and its receptor follows the same kinetics as enzymes and substrates. Typically, the binding of a neurotransmitter will open up an ion channel, as we've been discussing. The effects that a neurotransmitter will have depend upon the receptor. This is very similar to what we discussed in the endocrine system. However, neurotransmitter receptors typically have similar effects, which means that we can lump neurotransmitters into one of two categories fairly accurately. Many neurotransmitters are typically excitatory. These will lead to depolarization of the postsynaptic cell. Other neurotransmitters frequently act in an inhibitory fashion. These will hyperpolarize the postsynaptic cell. We often call chemicals that act this way depressants, whereas those that stimulate neurons, stimulants. Nevertheless, the effect that a neurotransmitter has is absolutely determined by the receptor. And in some cases, different receptors may have an entirely different response to the same neurotransmitter. We will see this with acetylcholine. It can open up the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, causing depolarization, but there's going to be some other acetylcholine receptors that can inhibit target cells. Any synapse where acetylcholine is released is called a cholinergic synapse. This includes all of the neuromuscular junctions with skeletal muscles, as well as many synapses in both the central and peripheral nervous system. Cholinergic synapses may involve binding of acetylcholine to a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which could depolarize the postsynaptic cell, but then very quickly this acetylcholine is removed by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. There are at least 50 different neurotransmitters in the nervous system. We're only going to cover the major ones. Glutamate is one of the most common ones. We'll also be talking about norepinephrine this term, as well as dopamine, serotonin, and GABA. This is in addition to acetylcholine. But there are many other chemicals which can act as neurotransmitters that we won't be discussing. For a drug to affect the brain, two things must be true about it. First, this drug must be able to cross the blood-brain barrier. Secondly, it either has to bind to a neurotransmitter receptor by mimicking a neurotransmitter, or it must somehow affect the metabolism of that neurotransmitter by increasing or decreasing levels of that chemical. Just for fun, Here's a big list of some psychoactive drugs that you may recognize, and the neurotransmitter receptors that they activate or inhibit. I'm not going to spend time reviewing the entire list. Go down through and look where nicotine and caffeine wind up, where drugs like amphetamines and barbiturates are located, where SSRIs, which are medication, and the psychoactive compound LSD and THC are located, and pain medicines like OxyContin and codeine are located. You'll notice that OxyContin shows up on both sides of our list, so we're going to need to explain that in an upcoming lecture. One cell may have lots of dendrites with thousands of different axon terminals making synapses on those dendrites. So far, I've been drawing it really simple, just one cell connecting to another. That means that one cell may have a lot of different neurotransmitter receptors on its dendrites. 
However, its axon terminals will only release one neurotransmitter, even if it's got several synapses. Many neurotransmitters can bind to multiple neurotransmitter receptors. One example of that is acetylcholine. One part of the molecule of acetylcholine can bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, that ligand-gated ion channel that you should be familiar with by now. A different part of the same chemical can bind to the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, which you may remember from last quarter. If not, I'll review it in a few slides. Different parts of the same chemical binding to different receptors means that I can design different drugs that would activate only one of these receptors or the others. The fancy name for the part of the drug that binds to the receptor is ligand. And that's why I say ligand gated ion channels. It's not the entire chemical that activates the ion channel, just part of it, the part that fits in the active site. Acetylcholine can bind to muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, which are not ion channels. So we need to make our neurotransmitter receptors a little bit more complicated now. Many of these neurotransmitter receptors are known as second messenger linked receptors, meaning the drug binds to the outside surface of the cell and activates a second messenger inside of the cell. For instance, acetylcholine binding to a G protein coupled receptor activated a G protein, which activates an enzyme called adenylate cyclase, which makes a small molecule called cyclic AMP. All of these from the G protein down to cyclic AMP are known as second messengers. If you don't remember this from last quarter, pay attention to these last three letters. This stands for adenosine monophosphate. So we take a molecule of ATP, remove two of the phosphates, leaving us with just one, and then reattach that phosphate back to the molecule in a circle. And we've got cyclic AMP, which is made by this enzyme, adenylate cyclase. And this receptor over here was called a G-protein coupled receptor. That means it is coupled to a G-protein. The reason that some neurotransmitter receptors activate second messengers rather than ion channels is that second messengers allow us to amplify the signal. Activation of just one muscarinic acetylcholine receptor can activate lots of G proteins, each which can activate lots of adenylate cyclase enzymes. Each of those can make millions of molecules of cyclic AMP every second. This greatly amplifies the original signal. Of the neurotransmitter. G protein coupled receptors are just one example of a second messenger linked receptor, but the only one that I'm going to put on the test because these are not only the most common, they're also the most relevant for upcoming lectures in the cardiovascular system and the visual system. In addition to amplifying a signal, second messengers can also diversify a signal leading to multiple responses in the cell. To contrast this with the ligand gated ion channels, those types of receptors only do one thing, open up an ion channel and allow an ion to move. So that was a second class of neurotransmitter receptor, the second messenger linked receptors. And the one example that I covered was a G protein coupled receptor. That one will be important throughout the term. And we also talked about the release of neurotransmitters from the synaptic terminals. This will lead us to our last section about how neurons can manipulate information. They do more than simply transmit information. To understand this, we need to understand that neurotransmitters can activate receptors that will either depolarize the cell or hyperpolarize the cell. The ones that depolarize the cell, we would say cause an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or an EPSP. 
ones that hyperpolarize the cell, we say cause an IPSP, or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Remember, we could have thousands of EPSPs and IPSPs occurring on the same neuron. All of these signals will sum together. EPSPs would add on top of one another, bringing us closer to threshold, whereas IPSPs at the same time would bring us back downwards, away from threshold. So our next topic is to talk about how these individual synapses can sum together. For the average neuron, activating just one synapse will not be enough to bring the axon hillock to threshold. We need more than a single graded potential. If I had multiple graded potentials occurring at the same time, this might add up to bring me to threshold, but if I also had IPSPs at the same time, I still might not reach threshold. To fire an action potential, I need enough stimulatory signals activated at the same time. That could bring the axon hillock to threshold and I could fire an action potential. For instance, if I was walking down the street and I saw a donut on the ground, that's probably not enough to make me bend over and pick up the donut and eat it. If that donut was a chocolate donut and there was nobody around, then maybe those three signals all together would be enough to activate the neuron that triggers me to bend over and pick up the donut and eat it. Actually, let's be realistic. If it's a chocolate donut, that's enough. And that shows that not all synapses are equal strength. Synapses that are closer to the axon hillock will be stronger, more capable of bringing the neuron to threshold than synapses far away. So for me, the mere sight of a chocolate donut should be enough to get me to eat it, as long as there aren't IPSPs happening at the same time, such as it's covered in a bunch of bird poop. So we call this summation. EPSPs, or small positive graded potentials, can sum together to bring the neuron to threshold. Until we reach threshold, nothing's going to happen. But once we do, that should trigger an action potential. Summation comes in two flavors. It can happen over time or space. Temporal summation means one synapse firing over and over and over again until the neuron reaches threshold. This is like the child in the grocery store going, mom, 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 mom. By about the 10th time, finally, mom fires an action potential and says, what? Spatial summation involves multiple synapses all firing at the same time. Maybe five kids are all yelling at the same time, and it only takes once to get the attention of a parent. That is spatial summation. To summarize, it usually takes more than one graded potential to bring a neuron to threshold and fire an action potential. Graded potentials can sum together. If they do so positively, we call this summation. IPSPs, though, can take away. Not all graded potentials are going to be the same strength. For instance, synapses closer to the axon hillock will have a bigger effect relatively over the voltage at the axon hillock. We need to cover another class of molecules called neuromodulators. These are similar to neurotransmitters, but whereas neurotransmitters transmitted a signal, these chemicals change a signal. They're not the signal themselves, but they can change how other signals are perceived. Their effects tend to be fairly long-term, meaning they change how cells respond. Neuromodulators are sometimes released at the same time as neurotransmitters, but the neuromodulators often alter the transcription and translation of DNA increasing the amount of neurotransmitter receptors at the synaptic cleft, for instance. This postsynaptic cell will now respond to the signal in a greater fashion than it did before, 
the neuromodulator has changed the strength of the postsynaptic cell. For instance, let's say I dumped four molecules of acetylcholine onto the cell, but it only had two receptors. I would get a small graded potential, but maybe not enough to trigger an action potential. But now that a neuromodulator increases the amount of acetylcholine receptors, this same signal may generate a bigger graded potential. I have changed how this postsynaptic cell responds. It has been modulated. I didn't change the signal, just the response. SSRIs can act in this fashion. They change the strength of signals, and they do so by blocking the reuptake of neurotransmitters as they are released into the synaptic cleft. This is similar to acetylcholinesterase, but instead of breaking down the neurotransmitter, they just pump it back into the presynaptic cell. So at a baseline state, this neuron will release some serotonin. It binds to serotonin receptors and generates a graded potential. And then it's recycled, pumped back into the presynaptic cell. But maybe that signal wasn't big enough. If we want to boost the strength of that signal, one thing that we can do is block the activity of that reuptake enzyme. And that's what SSRIs do. The next time the cell fires an action potential, it will release the same amount of serotonin, but that serotonin lingers in the synapse for longer, and it can add to the serotonin that's released from the next action potential. This would create a bigger graded potential and could alter the behavior of the postsynaptic neuron. Why do we do this sort of double negative? If I wanted to boost the strength of serotonin signals, why not just dump a bunch of serotonin everywhere? And the answer to that is we want specificity. Let's say I have four serotonergic synapses and only one of them is releasing serotonin at this time. If I were to add an SSRI, that would block the reuptake of serotonin. And as more serotonin got released, that would increase the strength of the serotonin signal at this one lone synapse, only the synapse that was already active. The other synapses would have no change. That's in contrast to simply dumping serotonin everywhere, or more realistically, using a drug like LSD, which can activate serotonin receptors. LSD will activate every serotonin receptor, the ones that you wanted to use and the ones that you didn't want to use. And this can trigger effects that maybe you did not want, such as visual hallucinations. In medicine, we frequently use drugs that inhibit inhibitors, whereas drugs of abuse often simply activate neurotransmitter receptors everywhere that they can. So be prepared to see this sort of double negative pattern over and over in medicine. It allows us specificity. SSRIs can be used to treat many forms of depression and some other conditions. We might ask the question though, were these drugs invented with the idea that boosting serotonin might be able to treat depression? And the answer is actually just the opposite. These drugs were invented and then discovered to work. Then we figured out how they worked and we had to alter the old theory of what caused depression. We previously thought it was norepinephrine levels and adjusted it to say, oh, well, maybe it's serotonin. Maybe SSRIs work by boosting serotonin. Therefore, depression might be caused by too little serotonin. But there's a couple big problems with this theory. First is there's no evidence whatsoever that patients who suffer from depression have depressed levels of serotonin anywhere in their brain. The second major problem is that SSRIs can boost serotonin levels the very next day, but we don't see any effects on the symptoms of depression for about a month. This has led to a change in the serotonin theory of depression. Maybe SSRIs work by inducing a homeostatic feedback loop, thereby decreasing serotonin levels a month later. Therefore, maybe depression is actually caused by too much serotonin, 
we still have this problem of we don't see any differences in patients with depression or without in their serotonin levels. And it also is problematic because we don't trust people when they reverse course 180 degrees. We would like to see some better evidence. And in the next chapter, I will give you a better theory for what might actually be causing depression. Certainly serotonin must be involved because it is very effective for many people at treating their depression. So that wraps up synapses, some different neurotransmitters. We had to go back over second messenger linked receptors. And then I didn't use this word very much, facilitation. Instead, I said summation more often. And neuromodulators could help change signals. They could increase the strength or decrease the strength of neurotransmitter signals.